Let's go to the year 2002. The year marks the start of the digital information age, as total digitized information in the world exceeded traditional analog information. The year in which companies such as HyperX, ASRock, and Be Quiet were established. Blizzard announced StarCraft Ghost, never to release it. Valve released Valve Anti-Cheat for their Steam client. Microsoft released DirectX 9 and PCI Express was approved as a standard. The year which saw the release of parts we are going to use in our 2002 high-end gaming PC build. Let's introduce the parts we have at hand. The foundation of our build is the Asus P4S8X-X motherboard. It utilizes SAS648 chipset and has AGP8X support, which will allow us to run newer AGP cards for reference, although to various success. Three DDR1 slots at the max of PC2700 and 333 MHz can hold up to 3 GB of RAM, which is a lot by 2002 standards. Up until writing the script, we thought it can hold only up to 2 GB, so we ran it in that way, without even checking. For CPU we have the strongest Intel Pentium at the time, which is Pentium 4 at 2.8 GHz. While still running at 533 MHz FSB, it has 512 KB of L2 cache, thus making it a truly solid single-core CPU. We'll seal it right away to avoid its pins getting damaged. For memory, we plan to use our 3-piece 1 GB kit of PC2700 DDR1. But we encountered some stability issues and instead we opted for 2 GB of 400 MHz memory, which will be downclocked in our motherboard down to 333 MHz. Our graphics card is one NVIDIA GeForce TI 4200, which may not be the best graphics card at the time, but it was so damn close. It's a mid-range card which could achieve almost anything, as it's more expensive counterparts for about half the price. And as extra, it could have been overclocked to match top-of-the-line TI 4600. If we had the aforementioned TI 4600, this would be an ultimate gaming build, but we couldn't catch one in the wild, so we are sort of stuck with this not much worse choice. Funny enough, both of these cards are deprecated by DirectX 9 we mentioned in the intro and new shader model, as neither supported those technologies. For CPU cooling we have some socket 478 cooler options. Socket 478 has coolers that are incompatible with any other CPU socket, so we have a limited choice there. We'll most likely use the Arctic one, as it looks meatier. For case, we'll use our trusty makeshift test bench. It's simple enough to build in it, and it gives us access to all the parts at any time. With storage, we're once again aiming for stability, so we'll be using these SSDs, one for the system and another for game installations. You may notice that we don't have SATA connections on our motherboard, so we'll have to use this ADA to SATA adapter. It's a handy thing and simple to use. It's even possible to boot from drives connected through it. Unfortunately, in the end, we only managed to get one of these working, so we were unable to use our gaming library SSD. For power supply, we have this small LC powered 380 watt PSU. While it may not look like much, it works more than fine, and it has a floppy power connector we need for powering on our ADA to SATA adapter. It's time to assemble this PC. We'll start with SSDs already attached to our test bench. We're using an Arctic CPU core, so it only makes sense that we use Arctic thermal paste, right?
while posting properly, our build shows no picture. It turned out that our Frankenstein monitor connection wasn't that much alive. We had to use a different one. So here we are a bit later installing Windows XP operating system. Beside TI4200, we'll run benchmark with some additional cards, just to compare the results. We had more than a few issues with extra cards, but these are still valuable results, in a way. First, we have NVIDIA GeForce 6600, which is two generations younger mid-range graphics card. Sadly, while its performance looks fine, we had a lot of artifacts with this card. Another extra card is ATI Radeon HD4650 AGP version. It's one of the most powerful AGP cards ever. We had a lot of driver issues with this card and Windows XP, so the results we got with this one are outright questionable. Back in the day, AMD drivers were the paragon of sheer incompetent brilliance and obscure cards like AGP versions had even less prominent support. Especially on older OS, which Windows XP was at the time of this card's release. In 3 Mark results, we also included our NVIDIA GeForce FX 5200 results, just to compare TI4200 to its successor in this glorious NVIDIA naming scheme. Let's start with one of the prime examples of optimization and stability on Elder Scrolls game, the third one, Morrowind. These results don't make any sense, but we can see that this 2002 game was very much playable on this setup, even at higher settings and sort of pulling off full HD resolution. The next game has revealed itself not to be much of a benchmark, but we had to try it out. Warcraft 3 ran stable with any card and any preset. We achieved the most stability with HD4650 here, as it ran the game pretty stable at 60fps on a high preset. The next one is Far Cry. Here our results are following some semblance of logic, as presumably more powerful cards were giving better results. TI4200 was pretty playable at medium settings, but it has shown more grit with settings on the lower side. Here we encountered problems with HD4650 drivers and our full HD monitor, as drivers decided that the monitor wasn't full HD, and decided to display the game panned, which made it unplayable. So no high preset results for this card. 6600 had a bit stuttery performance on high preset, which is fine considering that our high preset here is using 1080p resolution. The otherwise very stable performance here from 6600. In Fear, TI4200 performance was suboptimal on all presets but low, and we won't call this playable. HD4650 had the same panning problem, and 6600 wasn't able to fetch more than 1 FPS. Rest of the system was more than capable of running this game. Oblivion requires DirectX 9, and TI4200 isn't able to run it properly. We tried to use old Oblivion utility to make it run, but we didn't have any success with it. GeForce 6600 had its artifacting flaw at full display here, but frame rate was somewhat fine, but yet not playable. HD4650 had same 1080p panning issue here. On other presets it managed to get up to 30fps, which is playable frame rate if you are a right kind of masochist. With high CPU load it's most likely the rest of the system is the issue here, as at this point in 2006 our 4 year old system shows its age. We tested our system with all possible versions of 3 d Mark. For some, we had issues with random errors that pop up when you try to run them, others simply require newer technologies which our graphics cards simply do not have. Just for fun, we included 3 d Mark comparison with modern 2021 mid-range system. These cannot be viewed as exact data, but you can still see some progress PC hardware made in the last 20 years. All in all, system held up pretty well. Its single core performance made sure it stayed relevant up until multi-threaded applications became more prevalent. 2 or 3 GB of RAM were more than enough for a few years to come. As for graphics card, TI4200 was a great deal, even when you consider that it was mostly deprecated pretty fast in its life cycle. You could still run relevant games at formidable frame rate. While the price of the system at the time wasn't astronomical, you could still get a better deal for a mid-range system. But we have to state that it's one of the rare occurrences where you could get a good deal for the top-end components. It was definitely fun to build, and we hope you enjoyed this one. See you around!